lecture three of the Dead Sea Scrolls. So today we're speaking about the manual of discipline. We're actually really starting to dive into one of the most famous scrolls. I know the first session we spoke a little bit about uh, what's in the scrolls, but we're really going to take a much deeper look now into this particular scroll, which is very uh, important for the uh, to understand the development of this very interesting community here. So first of all, what is it? It's also known as the rule of the community. And in Hebrew, it's Sarah Hayachad, which the Yachad meaning like one in Hebrew of a collective really is a good translation from the word Achad, Yachad. So they really view themselves as the one. It's the way they designate themselves. And we're going to see they view themselves in a sense as a singular unit, a collective. So that's uh, the reason why it has that name. And it's very clear from looking at this text that this sect, this Qumran sect practices diverge from what becomes rabbinic Judaism. So remember at this time, we don't have rabbinic Judaism the way we're thinking about it nowadays. What you have are Pharisees, Sadducees, and Essenes are the major sects. You have some smaller groups as well. As we've already said, this Qumran sect probably is uh, a more uh, drastic form of an Essene sect even though that's open to some debate here. But it's eventually that uh, Pharisaic Judaism more or less morphs into rabbinic Judaism. That's certainly a very uh, painting with a wide brush, but we'll go off it just to get a general uh, idea. So we're gonna see the practices of this sect are gonna diverge from uh, Pharisaic Judaism, which uh, gives us a groundwork for the Judaism that we still practice today. Okay. So a lot of their rights are similar to those of other Essene groups, and this is why, to a degree, scholars think they're probably a form of uh, one of the Essene groups. They have uh, an initiation process. They pool their finances, so they really are, are a collective, and they would eat communal meals together. They would also have an 8% tax of your money to uh, support the poor of their community as well, so they looked after each other. So the introduction of the text deals with the uh, community and the covenant, which is really, uh, what isn't particularly surprising. It's saying who the community is and basically the covenant is the, uh, is the um, way that the community, uh, the laws that govern the community. They view themselves as the sons of light opposed to the sons of dark. Now, when they talk about the sons of dark, it's important to understand they're talking about other Jews, Pharisees, uh, Sadducees, probably other groups of Essenes as well. We're not even positive they were Essenes. So basically, it's a very us versus them type of mentality. They don't even bother to mention non-Jews because they're not even worth mentioning. They're beyond the pale. So at least other Jews are they're worthy of being called the sons of darkness. They're in the conversation. They're just the misguided ones. The non-Jews, other peoples were not particularly interested in here. Okay. So uh, this us versus them type of language is a language you would expect of a group that sees itself as a small minority, perhaps an oppressed minority. It's basically the world is out to get us, but we're going to remain together and strong and despite the odds prevail. Now, how did one get into this group? One volunteered to become a member of the Yachad and this pooling of resources corresponds to what Josephus and Pliny the Elder, we spoke about them last time, this fits the description of the way they would describe other Essene groups as well. And members were exhorted not to deviate from the smallest details of God's word, which is not really a, a surprise. Most of these Jewish sects would, would say the same thing. They're all in one way or another saying we really are, are, are the legitimate form of Judaism. So, and at times, uh, with scholarship shows they actually speak harshly about each other, some of these sects, particularly later on in the Talmud, non-Pharisaic texts, uh, non-Pharisaic groups are spoken of harshly because the Pharisees become more or less the proto-rabbis who win the day. So they refer to, refer to others as meaning, sectarians as types, and those type of things. So they, each one of them thinks basically they're right. And uh, you should, uh, and you should be observant. So the fact that they're saying, well, you should follow God's word, not a surprise. 
in the least bit, they just happen to emphasize it more than other groups. Not surprising in the fact Josephus, in writing about these groups, says, uh, calls the, the uh, Essenes and probably the Dead Sea sect, he's saying these are really particularly pious people. Uh, they're, they're constantly talking about you really have to keep to God's world, word. Excuse me. Oh, so and one more point below is being blocked by uh, being blocked there. But they also talk about the importance of not altering dates uh, dates of the holidays. Now I have Shavuot, but even before we get to Shavuot, I'm going to be very impressed if anyone gets this. Where else in the Tanakh do we see uh, an alteration? Of a, of a holiday, or it seems to be at least, uh, if not an outright alteration, it seems to be creating a, another holiday to compete with an existing holiday. Any it wasn't, it wasn't the, the use of the second Passover. That's not what you're referring to, right? Oh, no, no. So is that Susan? So no, that's Pesach Sheni. The second Pesach you're talking about is actually referred to in the Torah itself for people who are simply ritually impure when the Pesach, the Paschal offering was brought. So that's already a, a biblical holiday, uh, a, a, biblical, a biblical status. It's actually, if you think about it, people don't tend not to make a big deal of Pesach Sheni, but if you think about, strictly speaking, which is the more important holiday, for instance, you're going to say Purim, which is coming up a Pesach Sheni. I think you have to go with Pesach Sheni simply because it's mentioned in the Torah itself, which Purim is a uh, later rabbinic creation, not to take away the importance of Purim, but you're going to say, and certainly Purim in the, in the Jewish mind is the more important holiday, but strict hierarchy, you go with, Pe you go with Pesach Sheni. So I'm talking about uh, uh, King Jer uh, uh, Yeravim, of the uh, of the northern kingdom of the northern king uh, no not a year I always uh, yeah uh, of the northern kingdom of Israel when he breaks away and he he breaks away it's actually it like King Yeravim is in the south King uh, it's King Jeroboam is in the north and he breaks away this is he breaks away from Solomon's son who's the king in the south and what he does is he creates a holiday um, basically a month after the fall holidays. Uh, of of the new year, the new year, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot. So he he later on, I believe it says in the eighth month, creates this holiday. And at least the idea you get is he's trying to compete with what's going on in the temple in Jerusalem, and saying instead of his saying to his people, don't go on a pilgrimage down south to the temple in Jerusalem. Stay up north, celebrate with me up north, spend your money up north at our shrines up here. A month later, and you could celebrate. You could celebrate this new holiday, which seems to be some sort of variant of, of Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot. So uh, we already do have that precedent set, and obviously that does not that is not viewed well later on by the. Uh, it's not viewed well in the text of the Deuteronomic history uh, in in the Book of Kings itself. It's not viewed well, nor is it viewed well later by the uh, rabbis, of course. But uh, more to the point of the Dead Sea sect, the reference here, I think, particularly is to Shavuot. Shavuot is, a, if you look at Shavuot, it's never, it's never given a date in the Torah itself. It's, it, the other holidays, uh, the first day of the month or this month or whatever, it's just given a date, that type of thing. Shavuot is not, is not given a date. Uh, the rabbis argue, uh, was the Torah even given on the 6th of Sivan, which we celebrated, or was it given on the 7th day of Sivan? Which is uh, the, which is the second day, which is only uh, only uh, celebrated in Chutzla Aretz to show the importance of respecting rabbinic law as well. In other words, the Torah itself was given Chutzla Aretz outside the land of Israel and Sinai. So, therefore, God to strengthen the hands of the rabbis and people wouldn't come along like the Sadducees and the Karaites later and say, "Well, rabbinic uh, rabbinic law doesn't really apply. It doesn't have the th God's authority." God is saying, "I gave the Torah according to at least the rabbinic view." God gave the Torah itself on the seventh day of Sivan to show that he respects rabbinic law here. But what happened, uh, the, the reason for the controversy is in the Torah itself, it simply says that you start counting the Omer. In other words, we have this countdown to Shavuot, and we're, suppo and we're, supposed, and we're supposed to celebrate it on the morrow of the rest from the day when you bring the Omer, a wave offering. So this is talking about Pesach, obviously, here. So, so when you talk about the morrow of the day of rest, it sounds like you're talking about the first Pesach that falls perhaps after Shabbat here. 
but the the, uh, the rabbinic approach is this day of rest is not Shabbat per se. It's the first day of Pesach, which uh, which is similar to Shabbat in the sense that Yom Tov, in many degrees, is similar to Shabbat. Most of the uh, most of the prohibitions, the things you can't do, the forbidden labors that you can't perform on Shabbat, you can't perform on Yom Tov. So according to the Torah Shabbat the rabbinic, the rabbinic read, or the oral law that becomes the Talmud, uh, we'll just say the rabbinic tradition, the idea is that this day of rest is actually the first day of Pesach, and then therefore we start counting the Omer on the second day of Pesach, and that's how we get to Shavuot. But you could read it, we could read it in other, other ways, it's vague, you could read it literally and say, well, the, the first Shabbat, which could be uh, three, four days into Pesach, to be five days into Pesach, that's when you start counting the Omer. So, so this group is saying, this Qumranist sect is saying, we have we have our traditions for when the holidays should fall. They shouldn't be reinterpreted. Uh, prob- this is probably a polemic against uh, Pharisees being overly, as they see it, creative. I don't know that for a fact, but I would certainly, that's an educated guess. Okay. So now we have another track tape here when we get into really, we're getting into the heart of this, uh, this text here. And it talks, about, it talks about a prince of light and an angel of dark. It's reminiscent of Zoroastrianism, which was a Persian religion. And um, this spirit of light and dark is in all, is in all people. So it's not, it's not just something which is a reference to certain people, it, all people have the spirit of light and dark in it. And this actually, when you think about it, this actually, this really resonates with people in a sense. If you think about movies which tend to, tend to be very popular, this is Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, a Corona lover, uh, point, pointed this out. Think about Star Wars, uh, basically a classic uh, battle against good versus evil, uh, literally the light and dark side of the force. So. Make his like, uh, what is it, Harry Potter, defense against the dark arts, that type of thing. So people tend to gravitate towards these very uh, simple images because it makes it easier for the mind to understand. You have good on one side, you have bad on the other. Seeing things in gray and nuance takes a lot more effort. And if you think about Midrashim in a certain sense, they do the same thing. The Torah, uh, particularly, think about Bereshit. It's full of stories about these characters and they're very complex people. It really, it really doesn't make judgment values about the people in particular. It doesn't say Avraham is good or Esav is bad. And, uh, and I know in Parsha and Pizza, people always point out that if you look at the Peshat of the text, Esav actually doesn't look like a particularly bad guy at all. You could certainly make an argument he's a better guy than Yaakov. But when you go to the Midrashim, the rabbinic lore, L-O-R-E, what's going on is the rabbis tend to make characters much more black and white. It accentuates the positive of Yaakov, and Esav suddenly comes off looking like a demon of some sort. So the fact that this group was uh, this group was talking in these terms of light and dark probably has a natural appeal to people, as people like seeing these uh, movies like Star Wars because it's so easily understandable. You know who the good guys are, you know who the bad guys are, and you know you know who to root for. I think it was uh, someone. Someone told me. And I remember having a discussion with uh, with Tom Leach, uh, who does a film professor, and we were talking about movie plots. And if you boil it down to it, the, the, there's really only a very small group of actual really movie plots. You have boy meets girl, rags to riches, riches, and one of the most popular ones is always that this good versus evil, this light versus dark. Okay, so now, now this becomes problematic. They have this idea that everyone has light and everyone has dark. But on the other hand, unlike, let's say, let's say uh, Star Wars, where you're supposed to reject the dark side and choose light, and then suddenly you've done a mitzvah by doing that, basically, by choosing the light side. Here, the, here are the, uh, the, the Essenes and this group in particular is into predestination, predetermination. In other words, they're denying the idea of free will itself. In other words, you're, you're destined to choose a path, which is kind of, it, this is problematic. And any group which deals with predestination always has these type of issues. How could you really hold people responsible 
if if they're already chosen to to be uh, to do it act in a certain way or be good or be bad or one group someone has chosen to be one of the elect and somebody isn't already it takes any really free will out of it and the round I struggle with is to a certain degree there's a statement in Perakea vote which says everything is foretold yet there's bechira yet there's free will okay so. Uh, I, the way I always understood that, that statement is, is it, it's not a challenge in any sense to free will. The rabbis are saying this free will. The problem is people say sometimes, well, if God has foreseen everything, do you really have free will? God knows what you're going to do next year, even before you've done it. And if it's the wrong choice, how can we really hold you responsible for making the wrong choice? Being God knows you'll make the wrong choice. So we, at least the way I look at it, I look at it two ways. First of all, I look at it in a certain sense. God has the movie of your life because he's God. So he simply knows the choices you're going to make. But it doesn't mean that you're still not directing your own movie. You're not making your own choices. So I look at it that way. And I also look at it in another way in the sense that I think what's being said here is everything is predetermined in the sense that everyone is born into a certain situation in their life, which is going to be a major factor in your life, where you're born, who your parents are, socioeconomic status, uh, your talents, your disabilities, they are what the, they are, what they, the, the, they are what they are. On the other hand, despite all these things which have been predetermined, it doesn't mean within that box, it doesn't mean that you don't have free will to make choices. Uh, one of the best quotes I ever heard was, was from, um, I'm trying to think of the, the Holocaust survivor, basically said, the one thing the Nazis couldn't take away from me is my, uh, is my choice how, how to react. In other words, when he, he saw when he saw someone else suffering, he still had the ability to go and comfort them. At least that they couldn't take away from him. So that Victor choice. Frankel. Uh, Victor, Victor Frankel. Victor Frankel, that was it. I blanked out. Victor Frankel. So a famous quote and uh, very profound and well said. Okay. Let's look at the status section, which is really uh, showing us how this, how this group here is run. So it seems to be supervised by the sons of Sadok. We've already spoken about him. This seems to be like the elite high priestly circle. Uh, Tzedek, as I said, was the uh, high priest during Shlomo, during uh, the reign of Solomon. It's actually, it's, uh, just an aside, it's a fascinating little story. Uh, David or David really doesn't make clear who's his successor is supposed to be as he's laying on his deathbed. And there's, uh, there's basically a little, uh, I don't know, civil war is the wrong word, but uh, Shlomo and Adinia, his other son, are jockeying for power. And Sadok is one of the two who are functioning as a high priest, and he basically picks the right horse, to put it crudely. He picks, he picks Shlomo uh, as the guy who's going to win the, the power struggle, not Adinia. Adinia eventually is put to death. And Sadok becomes the uh, the dominant high priest, and for years and years, his family, uh, the the high priest comes from his family. It's not till the uh, Hasmonean era, when the priesthood is bought and sold, that uh, it goes elsewhere. Not only does it go out of the um, out of this family, it actually is bought by Menelaus, as we spoke about in one of our Hanukkah classes, who's from the tribe of Benjamin altogether, which was a, a major problem. So here, uh, but, but, but actually, it's actually a good segue in the sense that that makes the point here. You have these people being led at least by uh, those of the high priestly circles basically saying, we think the Jerusalem priesthood is corrupt here, so we're going to set up shop in the wilderness and do it correctly. Maybe it's not, maybe we prefer to be in control in Jerusalem and Jerusalem and the temple, but they're so corrupt, we have no choice but to separate ourselves from those corrupt people. Now, to make it clear that after, uh, after Hanukkah and the Hashemunayim or the Maccabean uprising, you do have a return of those of the family of Aaron are serving as the Kohanim. The Hasmoneans were, uh, were Kohanim. They weren't from the priestly elites. They were from uh, Modi'in, which was a, a rural community at the time, but you do have a return of priestly rule. But here you have uh, these groups of uh, led by the high priest who are still very unhappy with what's going on in Jerusalem here. 
Okay, so they probably, these Zadokites priests probably were the original, originally formed the sect. And eventually uh, a figure ar arrives and becomes like the master teacher. The teacher of the righteous appears, Schiffman says no earlier than 152, perhaps a little later. So it seems to be happening. We'll talk more, a little more about this later on as we look at some of the other documents regarding the founding of the sect. But what seems to be happening here is the sect forms, you have, you have people leading it, but then you have this probably more charismatic type of figure really takes charge known as the teacher of the righteous. And later on, he's, he's juxtaposed to the wicked high priest who it's unclear who the wicked high priest is. He, is, he, he seems to be someone from uh, one of the uh, Hasmoneans, could be the brother of uh, Judah the Maccabee, Jonathan who later on takes over could be uh, Yanni Alexander, who we spoke about during the first session, who was built, uh, busy massacring everybody for pelting him with Etrogim, even though it seems to be more directed at the Perushim, the Pharisees. But we have this teacher of the righteous who becomes the leader of the community. And he emphasized, again, that we really do have this division, good versus evil, light versus dark. They also had two messiahs, uh, they had a messiah of the house of Aaron, and then one for more of Israel in general. Now, I don't know, I'm just, I was thinking about it when I was preparing for the class, did they really see themselves as the, uh, as the uh, progenitors of the messiah of Aaron? In other words, are they the line in which this messiah of Aaron is going to come because they're the rightful high priest? It certainly makes sense, even though I can't, I can't tell you that for a fact. And I don't remember, uh, I don't remember Schiffman mentioning that, uh, unless he mentions it much later. I listened to list originally to his lectures years and years ago. I don't remember, I'm pretty sure he does not mention that. Okay, so uh, beyond, beyond the, uh, the leadership, as we said already, it was a highly communal life like most of the scenes. They, they focused on uh, eating, blessing, in other words, they had communal prayers and they would advise. In other words, they'd have communal meals to uh, communal meetings together. And just like this, this is really a lot of this is what would go on in a shul today, by the way, is you have prayers, you have communal meals, you have meetings where you make uh, decisions which are religious and communal in nature are made. Uh, remember, Bet Knesset originally uh, means or does mean a meeting house. And during the during the ancient time period, it seems to only be later on that the shul really turns more into a prayer house. Originally in the third century BCE, like in places like Alexandria, Egypt, they, they seem to be basically places where Jews congregate to have meetings and, and study Torah. And later on, they seem to take on more of primi the primary purpose is really uh, tefillah, prayer. Oh, sorry, you, you uh, couldn't bring in outside items uh, when joining so, and the reason for that seems to be that they were very concerned particularly about uh, purity. They didn't want you to bring in something that's uh, tame, impure. So you, when you came in, you, you couldn't, it's not like you could uh, call the moving company and said, I'm moving into the Qumran area, so pack me up. You basically came with, I guess, the shirt in your back. Maybe they made you get a new pure shirt too, that I'm not really sure of. Well, actually, they, I say, take that back. They did give you uh, the... Uh, the loins and, and the robe, and the, they did have a uniform, so they, they even gave you that, apparently. Um, and there were penalties, uh, penalties for not being properly pure, as well as other type of offenses, uh, and they could be, they could basically imprison you, confine you, those type of things. They could reduce your food rations or put you on a strictly liquid diet. I guess it's a crude version of Weight Watchers. Uh, they could even expel you temporarily uh, or permanently as well for infractions. So you, you played by the rules, basically. Uh, they had an examiner of records and uh, he had to approve business dealings as well. So it wasn't just uh, strictly uh, ritual. They had laws to govern the society as well as any society. You can't have only laws which tell you how to pray. You have to have other rules uh, to let people make sure people get along with each other. And we see in Judaism, these things are all merged under Jewish law and all considered and all considered holy. The Talmud tells us if you want to really be a firm person, you, you really have to be careful in civil law as well. So I'm not saying that they, they had a separation of church and state or, or state or religious and civil law, law, it all was religious law, but they had these type of civil, they addressed these civil rulings as the Torah does as well. 
and uh, the examiner and these people could be lay leaders. Not everyone had a, who had authority had to be a priest. Rabbi? Rabbi? Yes, Scott. You mentioned that they prayed. One of the things that's in, in the Serech HaYachad, this community rule, which I think people might find very interesting, is in column two of this document. Mm -hmm. They have the Kohani, the Birkata Kohanim, the way they recited it. They didn't change the Torah text, but when they recited it, it's very interesting how it changes from the way we do it. They still, it's still a three-part blessing. But what they do, they number one, they eliminate God's name. They do not use God's name and they change the meaning. May I recite just so you could see that people may find this very interesting. I would I would be delighted, Scott. Thank you. Instead of you know, if people that are familiar with the Kohanic blessing, Yabarakha Hashem Yabarak Yishmarakha, may God bless you and keep you. They would say Yivarakha the Hol Tov Yishmor Ha Mikol Ra. And they use the weak ending, not the final chaf, but the chaf and the hay. And that means may may he bless you with all good and may he guard you from all evil then the second one that we are used to right is yair hashem panave lecha vichu neko you know may may god may the lord countenance may the lord's countenance be upon you and be gracious to you they say the yair livcha vesecha chayim May God's light be upon you with his living, um, living um, intelligence. And may he be gracious to you with everlasting knowledge. And then finally, where we say, Shalom. May the Lord favor you and grant you peace. They would say, may, may Yisa Penai Chasadav, may the face of his pious ones come to you, go to you, with Shalom Olamim, with a perfect peace or an everlasting peace. You'll notice God's name is not mentioned anywhere in there. It's in, implied that it's he, that God is doing that, but God's name is not mentioned at all. And the words are changed a lot here. So it's interesting how they how they interpret it or how they use the priestly blessing. So I just wanted to share that with you, that it comes out of this community rule. They may have had a tab this is Karen. They Go ahead, Karen. Had a taboo about writing God's name because Art and I noticed when we were in New York um, looking at the uh, exhibit there. Um, when the Tetragrammaton was written out, it was not written in Hebrew. It was, it was written in Proto-Hebrew. It was written in a much older um, script, um, which uh, the people who wrote the notes for the exhibit speculated that uh, they felt it was probably considered to be holier. So they went back to an older script which well print that was no longer used um but there may have been a taboo about writing god's name i mean we still have a taboo about that and that's why you know we right so we worry things and that have that contain god's name right so i mean that's uh, that's certainly that's certainly possible that's so that's a wonderful uh uh insight uh and, and that may be a reason also what i just to just to uh, continue with what Scott was saying, particularly the first part of the, uh, Scott, what was the first part, the first verse of the blessing you, uh, in English, just give it to me in English again. It said, may he bless you with all goodness, and guard you from all evil. Okay, so I, what, what, what immediately I picked up on as you, was re as you were reading that is what we just discussed about, it shows that they have this way of viewing the world as good, versus evil and you have to guard us from the evil so we're already seeing that us versus them mentality there so it's also important to remember that this is this is uh this is a time period really before we have a fixed text the rabbis 
more or less fix the uh, the Amida in its version. In its version, we have uh, to the time of Rabban Gamliel, who uh, about ninety of the common era is really uh, is really the major force. This community is destroyed in sixty eight bef- uh, of the common era, and these texts uh, tend to most most of them are earlier than that. So it's not necessarily like it's this was a uh, radically different text in it in people's eyes there were different versions of them floating around you didn't have the printing press to standardize text on top of that like we have today so this may have been one of these many versions what would be interesting was was this the version being used at the temple at the time too or uh, or, or not now you certainly let you you'd want to argue that the text we have was really the text being used at the, at the temple, uh, and not, and this was a different version of the text, but I, I don't know that for sure, one way or the other, even though that, that would certainly be my guess. So, that, and, there's, and there's also, just related to this, uh, there's a, there's a machloket as to, the Ranban is involved, I forgot who says what, but basically, is when, when the Kohanim, when, when, they, uh, when they do Berkai Kohanim and they, and they bless, are they really, speaking like are are is it their mouth opening and god's voice is coming out of it or are they really speaking but they're acting more like a regular spokesman on behalf of god's words actually coming out of their mouth now by taking out the taking out uh hashem god itself it would certainly at least uh push this version of the priestly blessing into more of it's being offered the people offering it are not simply opening their mouth and God's voice is coming out, but they're offering it more on behalf of God. Okay, well... A general question. Jonathan. All, all the descriptions you've made, is this the is this set, is this the sect writing about itself and here's what we do? Or this is Jos, Josephus writing, oh, this is what I see these people did. I, I guess I got a little confused. No, no, so this, this is we're looking at their documents and seeing what they did. This is not Josephus commenting on them. This this is basic. This is basically we're looking at what they say, and this is basically what Schiffman is. Uh, Lauren Schiffman is basically drawing the conclusions he's drawing from from looking at their actual texts. So yeah, I, I mean, so if it, if it's Josephus, I'll I'll make sure to say. I know sometimes it's confusing when we start to talk and use pronouns and all of that type of thing. But if it's Josephus or Pliny or whoever, I will let you know that this is what they're saying. So this is actually we're looking, and the Scott was actually reading from the text. It's uh, from the text itself. So that was actually inside the text itself. Okay. Okay, so that was excellent. Let's move on. So other sections, the rule of the master. This is uh, specific to the uh, leader of the community. There was a section. There was a hymn of the master, a first person poem where the leader addresses God. Uh, Also, no reference to women here, suggesting that this may have been a celibate group uh, and connects it it particularly to uh, Essenes, who at least there was a sizable contingents of Essenes who are celibate. The idea also is Essenes tended to believe the world was coming to an end, God's kingdom was coming, so therefore you weren't necessarily in a rush to have more children. Okay, also uh, only male graves were found later on when uh, it was excavated, so may have not had any women around here. Okay, let's look at the initiation process. As we said, they were really big into purity, being tahor. So uh, ritual bathing was supposed to remove impurity and sin and was a form of self-improvement. And we have this idea in rabbinic Judaism, mainstream normative Talmudic Judaism, as well in the sense that the idea is, the Talmud talks about, I believe this is in, in a Yuma dealing with Yom Kippur, that if you're going to commit a sin, you can't say to yourself, well, I'll commit the sin and then I'll do teshuva. I'll just repent for it tomorrow. I'll sin today, repent tomorrow. And the analogy it gives is like saying, it's like saying, I'm going to go into a mikvah, but become pure and, uh, and purify myself, but I'm going to hold on to a sharet. So it is impure, uh, dead animal. 
be the impure dead animal obviously makes you impure and you can't be touching that impure dead animal when you're in the uh when you're in the mikvah because you're not pure you have to have no barrier between you and the water that's that's what makes you pure so what there's and it is and the, the talmud by the way says if you go if you uh, go into the mikvah with that attitude or you commit a sin with that attitude that'll do to shuva tomorrow it says there's not enough water in the world to immerse yourself in to purify yourself the, the ritual of going in the mikveh and purification is symbolic it's it's a real act but it's supposed to get you to change your behavior well so as well so this is what the uh the, the prophets during uh Nevi'im, uh Achronim, the later prophets are are always carrying on about saying these rituals are only really effective if they get you to change your behavior if you're going to go bring a korban a sacrifice and then they'll rip somebody off in business uh, god is not impressed with that you're really you're, this this is not what judaism is about these rituals are meant to improve you so they're viewing these immersions which they're really into as a way of yes as a ritual but this is really about improving yourself as well and the way you behave it was also the final act before admission to the Yachad, to the group. There's parallels in Christian scriptures. Uh, think about John the Baptist uh, baptizing Jesus and all of that in Christian scriptures. And think about a convert today, and we don't even have to talk about Christianity. Convert today in, uh, in Judaism still, what's the final act? The dunk in the mikvah. Same type, same type of thing. Uh, a woman uh, to become uh, purified so she can have relations with her husband again. You go to you go to the mikvah. So we have we have this idea here, like in the, all of Judaism, that these waters really are purifying. Okay, and, and it points out, and I made this point already. But if you're going to despise the divine law, in other words, you're not doing what God's supposed to do, uh, then it doesn't help you, as we already discussed. And when someone wanted, let's say you uh, decided you wanted to join the group. So what would you do? So what would you do? So basically, they'd have to have a vote to see if you're going to be accepted or not. Uh, but once you're, there's an initial vote, but it doesn't mean that you're in. Once you're in, then you have to go through a year of kind of preparing yourself. So think about it simply. You want to get into college or whatever it may be. You have to actually apply, go and have the interview and all of that. And then you first get into college. You don't get the diploma. You don't get the diploma after you finish the four years of work, all the coursework. So similar type of idea. They vote to uh, admit you, and I use the word applicant. I realize that's, uh, <laughs> that's, a, much, that's a much later word there. But uh, first they vote on you to see if, they, if they're going to let you really, uh, like, uh, like a, a fraternity, a sorority, a pledge. <laughs> and then you, and then, you try to, uh, then you try to get in. Uh, and they look at your, uh, are you committed, your beliefs and all that to make sure that you're in sync just as, uh, and even the, even shuls do this when someone wants to become a member of a shul. If someone has views which are radically not going to fit in, you're going to, you're going to show up to Addis Kodesh and say, uh, I don't believe, I don't believe in God and I want everyone to believe in me as a divinity instead, instead of the God of Israel, come worship me. I don't think we want to, we're going to take you as a member. We're going to say, well, this doesn't really fit in with our belief system. We're sorry. Okay. Uh, and as people were uh, starting the initiation process, this process, at first they let them come into contact with uh, hard food, but not solid food, but not liquid, being that the hard food or the solid food was less susceptible to tuma, which means impurity. Uh, liquid food became uh tame or impure much more easily so therefore you had to be more uh alone in your training before before we let you come into contact with that at the end of the year you were allowed uh your diet coke or whatever as they gave you your liquid food okay so uh next lecture we're going to talk about a little we'll take a little bit of a step back in a sense and really dig a, deeper into the historical context in which this sect is developing so we're going to look again at some of the other jewish groups uh as we've done in some of our other history classes but we're going to but the difference is we're going to talk more about how really what's going on Effect affects this particular group, and it's going to give us a lot of insight. So let me uh, X out of this screen share, and we'll go back into, uh, I know you had some good questions and participation. Uh, any other questions, answer, uh, questions, comments, that type of thing? Rabbi, I have a question. 
Oh, we have multi, we have multi. I heard Aida. I think I saw Marty. So let's go Aida and then Marty uh, Cohen. Does the comment at the end that after a year you're allowed liquid mean that you are not drinking for a year? Is that what that was supposed to say? You know, I'm not really sure. I wondered that. I'm not. I looked at uh, Schiffman's notes. I also looked at the other book that. Um, Karen, let me. What, Karen, what's his name? I had it in front of me, and I moved it by accident. A professor from uh, the other one who did the course, and at the professor from uh, Rutgers. The professor from Rutgers. Uh, the no, professor no. from Rutgers. Yeah, <laughs> Irene has it. Rens so I went Rensburg, and they're both they're both excellent courses. I've been looking at both of them, quite honestly, because they complement each other, and it didn't explicitly say. So I I don't know. I mean, obviously. There's something that something is missing here in the sense that you can't live a whole. I don't think you can live a whole year without uh, without some sort of liquid. You could go a lot longer with uh, out solids than liquids. So Rabbi? obviously something. Rabbi? Yes, Alan. Uh, yes. Talmudically, not, not, not necessarily Kohanim, but Talmudically, isn't it true that water cannot be tame? Isn't it true that water cannot be tame? And if that's true, maybe maybe water. Would you mean water, 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 or water per se, or liquid. Water. Water per se, or liquid. Well, in, it, in it, other words, in other words, in other words, could they, could they not have water, but not other liquids? I don't know, and I, I think what you're saying is kind of like you're stating it in very general, in, in a very general sense. Which uh, w water itself? I mean, liquids itself. They argue Pharisees and Phar I know Pharisees and Sadducees argue over liquids and does it give off impurity? But does a liquid? I'm not sure. I'm not sure, Alan. Uh, if in, in, uh, if there's such a broad idea or not, you may be right. I'm just I'm just not sure. I can't give an absolute answer to that. So it's possible. It's possible. Maybe they were drinking. Maybe they were drinking water, but not other forms of liquids. Now remember, it, again, I made the joke about the Diet Coke or whatever, but there's also less liquids to drink. It doesn't mean they didn't have any of a flavor type of beverages, but water was probably much more of a staple than nowadays we have many more options. Go to the supermarket and you get this <coughs> thing. But it's, I'll, I'll try to look into that. So, and uh, do me a favor, email me the question again, okay? When you have a chance. All right, um, other, uh, who was it? Marty, Marty Cohen. Yeah, you mentioned that the the sect was very communal and they didn't bring anything in, but then mm -hmm. you mentioned that business dealings. So I, I'm having trouble imagining what a business dealing could be if nobody had anything. Everything was communal. So I mean, I, that, that thought did go through my head as well. And again, neither one of the two professors I mentioned give that quite that type of detail. But even in societies where you have a, some sort of communal property and shared uh, i mean there are certain there are certain things which probably are seen more personal uh, shared and even like, like like think about it this way a library that's shared property but you could still have a, you could still have some sort of dispute over uh who gets the book at a certain time or if you don't return the book at a certain time so you still have these issues revolving around items and in a certain sense, I'm just thinking about this as I'm saying this, the fact that things are supposed to be shared and it, in a sense could heighten some of these tensions over if everything is shared, it's unclear whose is what. And if you have it and I want it at the same time, why should you have it when I want it type of thing? Or you had it for three days, why shouldn't I get it? So my guess is they're probably dealing with, they're probably dealing with these type of things. And also, I'm, not say, I'm just saying this as uh, someone who likes history a lot, is we all know that societies which tend to have these very nice ideas, which everyone shares things and that type of thing, usually it doesn't work that way. In reality, in reality, uh, and that's just human nature to a certain degree, is people like to know what their property is and somebody else's property is. So uh, these were probably ways of dealing, have, first of all, having rules that you didn't have conflicts, and then if you did have conflicts, then they could be dealt with in some sort of formal way, as opposed to people just getting angry and having fights with each other. Karen? Um, Rabbi, I think with this video, I think what the answer is, is that they spent several hours a day 
copying for it. So obviously they, that would be up for sale to people outside of their group. And they also had very large gardens and plantings. So uh, I'm sure they would sell some of that kind of thing. So I think that's what the business refers to. Okay, that, and that's, cer that's certainly, that's certainly uh, possible uh that some some of these other some of these business and again even if they're in business as a community you still have to have mechanisms for how to business internally and externally will be carried out so good point uh and they seem to be very into copying uh, scrolls so i saw i uh, harriet and i think i called on karen also so let's go to karen then harriet so we have the concept of Yetzer HaTov and Yetzer Hara within Judaism, but Zoroastrianism, Zoroastrianism takes it much further. Could you talk a little bit about how Zoroastrianism influenced them? So, I mean, I don't have much knowledge as far as particularly how it influenced them other than we know that uh, Persian religions, in particular, do influence Persians, and then Greek, and then I should add Greek, do start to influence Jewish culture. It's very, very clearly influenced Jewish culture regarding issues such as light after death, and that actually is is related uh, is related as well because when you talk about life after death, it actually gets into judgment, and then you have to be judged for your actions as well. So there are these clear clear influences and what and what what zodoastrium and, and greek and, and greek religion and even some of these older canaanite type of religions do over time is they really force judaism to come up with a theology and this is not this is not just qumran here this is judaism in general force judaism to come up with more of a advanced or elaborate theology about life after death you look at you look in the Torah. It basically uh, in the in the five books of Moses, Hamishay Chum Torah, virtually says nothing about uh, life after death. Vague references to Shaul, some sort of never world, and years through the Talmudic era, and even into the even uh, much later, 12th century, you have these midrashim being developed of talking about life after death, judgment, uh, angel, uh, the Malach Hamavet, the angels, uh, good, good and bad. So uh, I can, in general, you could see that it does influence Judaism and it does influence this sect. As I'm just going on what Sheffman, uh, Sheffman writes here, basically, is clearly, it's clearly, it's forcing the idea of, um, forcing the idea of, in stark terms of this good versus evil dualistic type of thought. Now, this dualistic type of thought, we're going to talk about it more because this sect is into dualism. This is rejected uh, by normative Judaism because we, we, we're concerned that this really undermines God. If you look at the Torah itself, the, uh, five, bo the five books, and I think the Tanakh, really, uh, Tanakh uh, for the most part at least, it doesn't, when it talks about angels, it says the Malach, these guys never have names. And, and the point is they're not supposed to because they can't challenge God in any way. Later on, really in the second temple period when the, the books of Ketuvi maybe are still, uh, haven't been put in their final form yet. But what we have, what we have there is then angels take on names and they have personalities because monotheism has been so firmly established and no longer a threat. So we're able to start giving them little personalities and, and things like that. Um, so, uh, so uh, like in a general context, we can see how Zodonastrism, uh, the religions of ancient Greece and others, uh, forced Judaism to come up with these uh, more elaborate, uh, eschatology is probably the right word, what's really gonna happen life after death and how you're gonna be judged in, partic in particular, which gets into this Yetzatov and Yetzahara, and free will, and of course, the problem is that it's hard to judge somebody if they don't really have free will. If they're, uh, if they're, it's predetermined. They're in or out, good or bad type of thing. Because not only was this an idea of good or bad, but it's an idea of your sons of light. You're, you're, you're uh, going to be saved. If you're uh, sons of dark, you're looking at it from the outside. Whereas in normative Judaism, really, is a rabbinic Judaism looking at it as you have the ability to control your fate and are, and are judged for it. Okay, good question, uh, Harriet. 
I'm wondering about the population of this group. How, um, how were they? How important were they? And, and um, especially since they asked for volunteers, and you had long initiation, and you had to be voted on. Did many people join this, this group? I don't know. I'm getting background here. Yeah, I'm sorry. Well, when I said uh, when I called your name, Harriet, my Google assistant on my computer is Googling Harriet now. I'm sorry for that. It's kind of the joys of technology. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Did you? All right. Can you hear me? Oh yeah. Okay. So, so I'm trying to get rid of this Google, Google Assistant. Okay. But they're around. This tech is around for a long time. I'm not Member Schiffman is saying that they're, they're clearly around by uh, 152. I'm not getting it. It's there's uh -oh. a lot of of me... inter, a lot of distraction. And yeah. is that better now? I can is that wait. better? I got rid of the Google. Is I that better now? Next week because it's not coming through clearly. I'll wait till next week. Just answer my question next week. Can anyone hear me? Yeah, we yeah. hear. Yes. Okay. Harry, can you hear me? Not well. I can hear you, Rabbi. I can okay. hear you. Okay, some people are saying they hear me fine, others are saying not so fine. No, it's it's so, staticky. Okay. It's a little it's a little it's a little staticky. Okay, I'm sorry for that. So uh, well, I'll, I'll give a short answer to Harriet's question. I'll answer it again next week in case uh, she can't hear. But the sector was around from 152 and the, uh, before the common era, the destroyed in 68 of the common era. So they're around a long time. So obviously you have people who are joining. Archaeologists, uh, I don't remember seeing it read, but how many people populated at one time? That I don't know. But clearly they have enough where they have a critical mass and are able to sustain themselves. Okay, so um, unless anyone has anything else, why don't we uh, end this here and we'll dive in.